I want to introduce Henry Reinhardt from Henry's Restaurant. Uh, thank you for being here, and thank you all panelists. Um, and I'll, I'll t leave it over to you, Henry. Thank you, thank you all um, for being here today. Hello, everyone. Uh, if you can hear me now, my name is Henry Reinhardt. I own a restaurant on 105th and Broadway. For the past 18 years, I've been serving the New York City community and uh, slowly learning this change everyone is making from food as flavor and how esoteric can we be in our flavor choices uh, to food as mood, food as something that constitutes our very being. And now um, food as wellness is something that everyone understands is uh, precedes medicine and that it makes you very much who you are. I watch people eat themselves into health crises and I see people watch, I watch people and I serve people every day who are uh, eating their way out of food crises. Um, in modern life, as uh, so many things, uh, old is new again. As Michael Pollan taught us, we learn to eat food, not that our grandmother would recognize as food, but that our great-grandmother would recognize as food. Mm -hmm. Food that is not a box, food that is not packaging, but food that is recognizable as a natural substance. Um, additionally, as uh, students of nutrition, as students of medicine, we are learning to teach our, our um, population's agency in the world of food and teaching people how to learn to take control of their own health outcomes. Our panel today is made up of five people very specifically in that space, teaching wellness, access to good food, and how to prepare it. Today in particular, cooking with healthy and healing ingredients uh, all food should taste good, all food should be fresh, all food should be identifiable as food, but that is a lot easier said than done in an environment uh, of great time compression, of great uh, time pressure, and where we have eliminated the three-family household, we've eliminated a lot of the people in our lives that used to cook for us and uh, everyone in the house is working and too busy for the thing that, bear, that sustains us. So today, this panel is really an effort to help us all learn ways that we can apply all these, desire, apply all these techniques and all this knowledge about food uh, to have a great day and be the best person you can by having um, a serious, and thoughtful approach to food. We're all um, hungry six times a day. Everyone knows you're going to be hungry. And the piece that we talk about when we talk about food in isolation from food preparation, or what I like to call food service, is that um, you have to plan ahead. Because when you start planning when you're hungry, you've lost. right? And teaching that in a time-compressed world is really complicated. But if you can get that message across and you can start thinking uh, ahead, you're going to have much better outcomes. My wife taught me something amazing. We finished breakfast, and she pulled from the refrigerator what was going to be for lunch. This happened to me when I was about 50 years old. And I sat and I looked at it, and it gave me this feeling of, oh, okay, the rest of the morning is going to be all right. Because <laughs> I know ahead that that thing that was cold and didn't taste great because it was refrigerated is warming and softening and being ready to be consumed by me. <laughs> and that, by itself, really changed my approach to feeding myself. And I think as you work in your life, as you, we all do our professional work with food, please think about how to teach people to prepare to feed themselves and to embrace feeding themselves. And I say this as a restaurateur, it's a pleasure to, cook, to have chef cook for you, but at the same time, I don't serve you every single meal in your day. 
So um, thank you, uh, Charles. Thank you for everyone at NYU Food Policy Center. A special thank you to Dr. Robert Graham, who has uh, brought us here together to examine something very important. And our panel today, we're going to look at how we uh, implement a lot of this stuff. Your doctors told you you're trying to pursue this health outcome. You're trying to avoid that food stuff. Now how do we do it? We have chefs. We have restaurateurs, we have growers, um, and we have uh, a real great collection of knowledge here to apply to help ourselves feed ourselves better. Um, can I start off with just asking everyone to please introduce yourself? I think um, I was going to start with Joy, as a woman on our panel, dear friend of mine, <laughs> the owner of Candle Restaurants, uh, and the woman who brought me uh, to work on the New York Coalition for Healthy School Food, where we promoted um, healthy plant-based diets for kids in New York City public schools very successfully. Joy Pearson. Thank you. My name is Joy Pearson, and I also want to thank everyone for being here, and I want to thank you, especially Dr. Graham. It's been really an honor to be on this journey with you, where we really could see the benefits and being a doctor and a chef and how great that is as a combination, because I really think that is the winning combination and that I think that is going to make the most change and education. And I, oh shucks, doctor. <laughs> We're changing the world one bite at a time and it takes this entire village to make it happen. I'm Joy Pearson and I'm a co-owner of the Candle Cafe, Candle 79 and Candle Cafe West in New York City. We do plant-based foods. And we really, um, also I sat on the board with Henry, we uh, put plant-based foods in schools where we were also, I don't know if anybody heard Tony Hillary, but I was with Tony in a school with Henry in Harlem where 90% of the kids were from battered shelters. They lived in shelters and a lot of them didn't even know what broccoli was. So I think it's, it's our um, privilege and, our, and their birthright to teach them all about good food. So that's been my life's mission. I'm passionate about food. I'm passionate about serving it, cooking it, meeting my farmers, growing it, and serving it to all of you. And it's really an honor and a privilege to be able to take food from farm and put it on the table every day at the candles. I want to also acknowledge B'nai and Bart, who are in the audience, who also make that possible because it's not a it's not a one man show. Like life is not a one man show, but <laughs> It takes all of us, and I think we've heard so many people today talk about how it really does take the advocate and how it does take all of us to support each other in, in health and well-being, and I do believe that food is medicine. Yeah, and as uh, our earlier panel, one of our earlier panelists said, uh, find your tribe, find your wellness yeah. tribe uh, around food. Uh, joy is my tribe. <laughs> um, secondly, I want to introduce Paul Lightfoot. Uh, Paul Lightfoot from Bright Farms is bringing, um, growing, bringing our greens closer to where they are consumed. Um, Paul, tell us, please. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. I'm also passionate about food. It's fun to be in a room full of people so passionate. So I run a company called Bright Farms. I'm not, I'm not a grower. The growers would be offended if, uh, if they said that I was. Um, it was a startup seven years ago, venture back. Now it's private equity back and growing quickly. We grow only salads, you know, baby spinach, baby romaine, baby arugula, kale, and lettuces. And we only sell them locally. You know, we size these greenhouse farms and we partner with supermarkets so that the product will never go beyond what a consumer would consider to be authentically local. Um, we're in hundreds of stores now, serving hundreds of thousands of consumers every year, none in New York, unfortunately, yet. Um, we're a mission-driven organization. Our, our mission is two-pronged. The first is we've all talked about today, which is to improve the health of people by getting them to eat things like spinach that, um, that will make them feel better, be healthier, and live longer. But the second prong we've maybe talked about a little less today is for the health of the planet. And maybe I could put a little, a little plug for the planet. Um, when we think about our health, we also need to think about you know, the environment that we're living in. And um, when I think about why I advocate people to eat more food like spinach and more plant-based diets, it's not just because it makes them healthier. It's because in this country, at least, you know, our, our food system is really a, a Midwest soy and corn production system that's bad for our health, 
super bad uh, for our environment and, and, and greenhouse gas emissions and um, and resource consumption. It's as if, and it makes us ill, right? It's as if we couldn't have designed a worse system for our health, for our planet, even for the country's uh, economy and healthcare systems. Um, and and so the end of my intro will be that one nice thing that we've seen, and, and I couldn't have predicted this specifically when I started this seven years ago, is that when we go into a supermarket, none of them have typically had local salads before. All the salads in this country come from, you know, Salinas or Yuma or, or Mexico. Um, in every case, there is more sales in the category, not, not, not just my brand, but there are more salads being sold in the same amount of shelf space because there's a local option, because people trust local, they see that it's fresher, it tastes better. Um, and I think it's driving more people to eat more healthy food. So I'm, I'm, I'm big and local. Thank you. Yeah, and I would add to that when we're looking at labels on our food, ideally we're buying food that has very limited labels because you recognize it for the food it is. And the label that you're looking for is where it came from. Right? Um, and just like you're not a grower, I'm not a chef but we do have a chef, <laughs> and Chef Richard Lamarita from uh, Natural Gourmet Institute. I want to hear from uh, a lot today, Richard. Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> well, without proper diet, uh, without proper diet, medicines are of no use. With proper diet, medicines are of no need. Through my source, through my sources, I heard that you heard that already this morning. Yeah. Um, it's a very true saying. It's a saying that comes from Ayurveda. Um, and that's really my background. Um, I have over close to 40 years experience um, studying Ayurveda. So I want to be the voice of Ayurveda today. It's a very profound knowledge. It's been thinking about this subject for close to 5,000 years. So it does have a lot to say. At the same time, I'm an instructor at the Natural Gourmet Institute, a school I am deeply proud of. I think it is the best health supportive school in the world. Um, I have been teaching there for 25 years, um, love teaching students and seeing students grow and seeing students get out into the profession, uh, making, making a name and making a living for themselves. I'm very proud to be on the stage with a graduate of the school and our CEO of the school. Uh, so we are making a big difference. Um, so I have, that's the voice I'm going to bring today. And when we hear from Richard, remember, he, uh, he's worked with Chef Floyd Cordo's at Tabla, correct? Yes, yes. Uh, who is the, the chef that all the other chefs love. <laughs> uh, next, we have uh, Galen or Galen? Galen. Galen uh, Foulois of Restore Food, uh, who studied at Natural Gourmet Institute. Please. Yeah, so my name is Galen Foulois. Um, I am a graduate, in fact, of the Natural Gourmet Institute. I founded uh, my company, Restore Food, which is based on the origination of a restaurant, which was actually not a place back in 15th, 16th century France. It was a dish of sweated meats and or vegetables that was served to people. So mm -hmm. you could actually get your nutrients uh, easier and faster. That was the philosophy. So my Restore Food vision is really rooted in personalized nutrition, uh, looking at our individual bodies and kind of diagnosing what we need in order to um, best support us through any type of illness and or prevention. So once we have those resources, I develop uh, recipes and kind of meal plans working with uh, nutritionists and doctors and other health practitioners to kind of assemble a uh, full-fledged team for individuals. So I work mostly on the private basis, but that constitutes anything from literally coming to your home to taking you shopping, um, and also you know writing recipes as well. So um, that's it. <coughs> and uh, finally, the C the aforementioned CEO C E O N G I. Uh, Jonathan Sednarski. Jonathan, <laughs> yes, I know uh, you're, you've been suffering from a cold, but please. I have been, and I must say in advance, I apologize if I start hacking into the microphone. <laughs> I will do my best not to, to do so. So uh, we're really delighted to be here. I mean, the exciting thing for us, certainly at Natural Gourmet Institute, is we've been having this conversation for 40 years. And we're delighted that finally we're having this conversation with all of you. <laughs> right? so, so it's really exciting. And... Um, and we're, I'm a 
I'm really thrilled to be a part of this panel. And all through the day, we've heard a lot of people talking about food and food as medicine or food as health and food and well-being. And, and I think it's, it's more important and more powerful than ever. Um, and, you know, we, we talk and joke that, you know, we were kale and quinoa before anyone knew what it was. Uh, and we have graduated now uh, over 2,600 chefs in 33 countries around the world who are bringing this food as medicine and food and healing and health supportive message out to lots of people. And we're excited to see what's happening and the transformation that's going on in the world. Um, because I think, you know, as we've heard this morning, uh, pills aren't enough, right? And, 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 and nor should we rely on them. And if we start first by looking at what we're consuming and how we're consuming, and if we look at what's on our plates, we can actually live more healthful lives, that we can actually make sure that we are engaged, connected to our community, connected to our traditions. We can look at kind of solving problems before they become problems. And we can do so in this really rich and wonderful way. And while we are helping support the planet and, and make sure that how we cook and how we prepare things are not only good for us, but certainly how they're good for the planet and the communities around us. So super excited to be here. And most importantly, I have a second role these days. I'm actually Dr. Graham's principal. So, <laughs> so I'm keeping track of his, his performance today. <laughs> That's great. Um, we have about 35, 40 minutes in which to explore this question, uh, cooking with healthy and um, healing ingredients. And I'm going to posit to you what I said, we're hungry six times a day. I'm going to ask if we can, we're not going to get into a lot of the minutia of preparation. We're going to talk, I, I hope to talk uh, about each of the meal categories of six periods over the course of the day. And I'd love to hear from each one of us on some bullet points that you apply to a meal period or a period in the day when we're hungry that we can relay uh, to our audience that they can relay uh, in this medical environment. Um, I agree very much in the medical environment hearing uh, nutrition discussed on this level is absolutely important. Um, Joy talked about an event that we did with Tony Hillary of Harlem Grown at a school in Harlem um, that I took my chef of 45 years to. And uh, I told chef uh, we were supposed to cook for 200. I said prepare for 600 and bring 400 to-go containers. We used all of them. As he loaded into the car at the end of the night, he was crying. I said, chef, what's wrong? He said, now I know what hunger looks like. Mm -hmm. At that event, Tony Hillary saved my bacon, um, saved the bacon of our presenter, actually, uh, as the event got hostile around how can you afford to be healthy, right? So I, health is expensive in our culture. And I, as we answer these questions about these meal periods, please think, uh, keep a, a mind's eye on how we can do it affordably. I want, I as I've worked with uh, underprivileged populations around nutrition in New York City public schools, I give three steps towards health practices that are affordable that I believe ultimately will put green in your pocket, will put money in your pocket. Um, give, up give up soda and replace it with water, preferably not bottled. Buy bulk and in season so that you're at a green market, something's cheap and in season, buy a lot of it, prepare a lot of it, freeze it. And finally, and this is right to the point of this conference, use dark leafy greens in place of your medicines until you don't need your medicines and you don't have to pay for your medicines because dark leafy greens are a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. So as we look at that, I asked the panel, and anyone can start on this, um, we're talking about food, uh, and also when we talk about food, don't think about food in isolation, think about food as food planning, food procurement, food preparation, food service, uh, food cleanup, right? Um, so let's start with the first, our, our panel staples. Joy, maybe I'll start with you. Um, breakfast, we heard our previous panel's choices for breakfast. What to you is an ideal place um, in a food as medicine lens uh, for breakfast. Well, first, I just wanted to say one thing you said. I don't think they can afford not to eat this way because it's really medical costs and, and the cost of our own bodies going through such trauma is really too high a cost. 
And to watch our kids die, I mean, I actually watched a kid die here in Harlem in the hospital, mm -hmm. a 23-year-old. So it's like, <clears throat> I was with her parents in the room, and she said to me, it's your responsibility now, and I'm going to share my responsibility with all of you, to tell kids what their birthright is. She said, I grew up on McDonald's because I didn't know any better, and we didn't have any money. But it's, it, it was so painful to watch that it wasn't. So my breakfast, now to go to the mundane, to my breakfast. Um, you know, one of my favorite breakfasts this morning, sprouted wheat bagel with uh, cashew cream cheese. I'm a little more advanced than most cashew cream <laughs> cheese. And to have um, a carrot lox and uh, a chia pudding. Yeah, we make, we take carrots and, uh, and we marinate them so they have the consistency and the flavor profile. I love flavor and I love, and I think food can be nourishing on all levels and so that's, that was my staple. But also in terms of preparation, I think what you said also, Henry, we need to buy in bulk. I mean, Tony Hillary, I don't know if he's in the room, but he gives away his produce. You could go to the farm, connect with the earth, grow your own stuff, take it home. Like he said, you know, people didn't know what arugula is. We were in schools, Henry, where they didn't know what broccoli was. We actually really, like, <coughs> No judgment, but really gave people to try it, to taste it, to get excited about it. What can they do with it? It's really about also putting the joy back into it, putting the excitement. I love cooking in bulk and freezing. I love making my own stock and freezing it so I can use it in something so I can enhance flavor. I love using fresh turmeric. I love experiencing all of what the culinary cabinet, and for me, my culinary cabinet, Bart says it's the biggest... Uh, Spice rack is all culinary, like that has medicinals. Medicinals that you don't even realize you're eating. I think I spoke to somebody today who said they use, I think it was somebody in the room, that they use turmeric all the time. She's a, a professor at Syracuse. Um, she uses turmeric all the time, and, and it, it's healing, but they didn't realize. I mean, it's healing just as a matter of having it in your diet, and that she automatically had it in her diet, and then to be able to use it and have fun with it and to bring joy around what we do and to also get everybody together, like when you talk about filling the pantry and making the food, is to do it as a, as a team. Like, I love to bring my grandchildren into the kitchen. I think teaching people at a very young age is very important. We did a, a pediatricians in the kitchen at Candle Cafe West where we were teaching three-year-olds. They left so empowered and so excited. They created something healthy. They created something that they loved. One of the kids woke up the next morning and said, when's the next class? <laughs> At three. So it's like if we get it to be, and it's not drudgery. Drudgery never worked, never worked for me. It's about really getting excited. So when you say about filling my pantry and my staples, I get really excited about what I would what I would do and how I would also how we can help other people to do that. I'd love to be able to do that more and more. Paul. Is this the breakfast question for us? <laughs> <laughs> what did you what did you just answer? <laughs> breakfast. So I tend to eat the same thing every morning. I like to I like I make a lot of decisions at work, so I try not to make a lot of decisions when I start my day. I tend to eat oatmeal plain oatmeal with a little bit of this heavy peanut butter that I really like that you got to stir up and raisins. I have that every day. Today, though, <laughs> I had a good workout, and my 12-year-old daughter, who's a, you know, who read last year the young reader's version of Michael Pollan's On the Horse Dilemma, yeah. highly recommend it for tweens, yeah. and she went on a several month thinking about what she wanted to do differently, and she became a pescatarian, and really only when we know the source of the, the fish. So I think about making sure she's got the right proteins in her life. So before she woke up, I had made her oatmeal with a couple egg yolks, a little salt and pepper, savory oatmeal. And so I had a couple extra egg whites that I'd put in my oatmeal instead of the peanut butter and, uh, and raisins today. Yeah, to Joy's point about flavor, um, <laughs> having a foundation of something like a grain or a note and adding in ginger flavors. Today mine was uh, pomegranate, walnut, and if my wife had bloomed some chia seeds, I would have put some chia seeds <laughs> in there. But uh, these, these are things. And now we get... You got uh, a great to, wife. To, to Richard. <laughs> School us, Richard. Okay. <laughs> well, first of all, I think we have to give a big nod to, to nature in a way, because it's, an, it's not a minor miracle yeah. 
what takes place every day, uh, numerous times a day, where we take matter from the outside and we put it into our bodies. That's a strange thing in some ways. Um, and yet we turn it into bodily tissue, we turn it into energy, we turn it into intelligence. Gosh, we got to respect this. Um, we really have to make sure that this process, we really have to, you know, kind of honor this process. It's an amazing thing that takes place. We take it for granted. Um, my breakfast this morning was a piece of, was, was a hard-boiled egg. Uh, on a piece of whole wheat toast with some oil. Um, I also put a few slices of this really nice cheese that we had in, a, in our fridge. I had um, some fresh tomato and some braised red cabbage kimchi and some green tea. That was my breakfast. Sounds great, right? Um, I love pizza. <laughs> I, I, I know you're going to get to that question, Henry. What is my favorite food? So I'm going to get it right out there right now. It's pizza any time of the day. Okay? But, uh, again, I come from this kind of tradition of Ayurveda where it states that every day, or even every meal, get six tastes in your diet. According to Ayurveda, the six tastes are sweet, sour, salty, bitter, astringent, and pungent. There are many different foods in each of these categories. I don't want to go into the different foods. But each taste is doing something very unique in the body. Like sweet is building tissue. Sour is enhancing and strengthening digestion. Salt is regulating and balancing body fluids. Bitter is a natural anti-inflammatory. Um, astringent helps to maintain the structure of the body because of its drying effect. And pungent is, it increases metabolism, increases circulation, aids in the elimination of waste material. So I want to make sure, and it's taken me a while, I mean, it's, I've been kind of doing this for many years now, but it take, it's taken me a while to think whatever I sit down to eat, get it all in. Get it all in. And it's pretty easy what's, once you get the hang of it, to get it all in. Bitter was the tea. It could also be bitter greens, um, but it's possible to, to do that. It's possible to, to, to really respect the process of eating and, and, and make it into a meal. And it, it, I don't think it has to be complicated. I don't think you have to do very expensive foods. Um, I think anybody, anybody can do this. Now again, you know, I love to, to pick, I'm a, I'm a nibbler too. So I like to nibble on certain things, and th that's th throughout the day, and I don't go six tastes on my nibbling. But when I'm sitting here, <laughs> otherwise I'd be twice the size I am right now. Um, but certainly when I sit down to eat a meal, and I do like to respect the idea that I'm sitting down and eating a meal. I'm trying not to, to eat on the run. Um, this is my thought process. So we will get to snacks, but I just want to reinforce what uh, Richard said. The last time I saw this statistic, 50% of American calories are consumed in a car. Mm. And if you can take the time to be mindful and respectful of your food and teach this and uh, pay this forward, it has tremendous benefits to just slowing down modern life and allowing your body to absorb not only the taste and the flavors, but also the nutrition. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm going to pick up on Rich's baton here because one of my big philosophies is, uh, you know, our lifestyle. Um, and so I woke up this morning and meditated for like 20, 30 minutes. And that type of waking and becoming attuned to your body, starting to listen, starting to think about and process the introduction of getting, getting foods into your body to start your day, I think that's an awareness factor that we can all kind of carry through every part of our day. So you mentioned the, the six meals a day, um, really listening to your body, paying attention to what our hunger means, and then also finding the resources to understand what it is that you should be putting in your body at any given point in the day so that you can feel as attuned, as comfortable, as confident in the decisions that you're making and um, you know, leveraging the nutritional resources that really meet what your body uh, needs to function throughout every day. So, um, 
this morning I had actually some soaked oats in almond milk with some um, uh, with some fresh almonds and berries and a little touch of honey and cinnamon. Pretty tasty and uh, and a green tea. It's pretty delicious. I feel like I'm the same as everyone else, but mostly I had a cup of steel-cut oats uh, with some Brazil nuts and some sliced banana uh, with a decaf Americano with some almond milk. Because I love coffee, but coffee doesn't love me. So, um, and, and what I like about that this meal is that it's easy and it's portable and it's kind of economical. And I think to the, to the point that you were making with the question is that good eating or healthful eating can actually be accessible. And I think some of it is, it's just the knowledge, and I think Joy touched on that, like the knowledge of kind of how you take that healthy breakfast and how would you convert it to a family who's, who maybe has three or four kids and there is multiple jobs to go to and they're trying to get out of the house and, and McDonald's, is the, McDonald's drive through is the easiest option but why not make a family event where you are soaking your oats overnight, and if you can't afford to soak your oats overnight, then maybe instant oats may be okay too, and bananas are cost-effective, and you can get them, and they're pretty universally liked, and if it's not Brazil nuts or something exotic, it can be just some almonds that you pick up in the store, and you can begin to teach people the fact that these kind of meals are, are not just for a certain group of people, or you don't need to have a lot of money, or, or it doesn't have to be this fancy brand or fancy preparation, but the contents of it can actually be translated into almost any budget. And if you can, can take that, you, you end up feeling very kind of satisfied, you are energized, you're ready to go. Uh, and for a family on a limited budget, you know, having something prepared the night before as a soaked oat, and then you can just pick it and grab it and go, it's still probably more cost effective than stopping at that McDonald's and it's nutritious and the family can be a part of the experience of preparing it. Yeah, and I would also, uh, I think the idea, more and more I come to understand uh, good, healthy, sustainable food is simple. Mm -hmm. It's simple. It sounds complicated when you have to learn to pronounce turmeric, <laughs> but uh, it, it's still, you acquire these things over time and be mindful when you're uh, dealing with patients or you're dealing with your population around food. We all live in a wildly toxic food environment with so much fake news around food <laughs> that, that it is, uh, you are really uh, have to be patient and persistent. Danny Meyer, the great food service professional, talks a lot about constant, gentle pressure. It has to be constant, has to be gentle, but it must involve pressure. Otherwise, you can't combat this in, this stew that we uh, live in. Um, let's go right on to lunch. Do you want to um, stay with Richard? Do you want to go? No, my lunch? <laughs> Not necessarily your lunch. Oh, just be uh, mindful. We're talking to uh, oh. medical professionals or oh. on their way to medical professionals, and that we are talking about healthy eating and uh, what are some optimal ways to get uh, medicinal ingredients into your food. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, hmm. Well, it's a big question, actually. Um, well, one thing you have to understand is I'm at the school a lot and eating a lot. <laughs> um, so sometimes my lunch is what's in the class. Uh, you know, when I, when I have my own day, that I plan my own lunch. If I'm at home, I definitely plan out a bit of a lunch and I stop what I'm doing and I go into the fridge and I But if put you're some, a busy average I, American I put something together. In, in this toxic food environment, what do you recommend to people for accessible healthy lunch? Um, the, I mean there are obviously we go out we you can go to any store and pick up pick up you know a sandwich that's that's healthy you can pick up um, you know, foods that are healthy from the market. You can you can go to restaurants and good restaurants and quick and um, you know fast food, but not McDonald's fast food, but places like Dig In, for instance, which is a great great uh, place, and you can get you can get healthy meals. Um, some things I can't live without, for instance, are spices. You know, I want to make sure that I'm that I'm getting spices throughout the day. Um, I think the power of spices in, in your diet is, is very huge. 
So I'm always aware of what's out there and how I can increase spices. Turmeric is also mentioned. Turmeric is a great anti-inflammatory. I can't live without ginger, cumin, and black pepper. I mean, I will have those every day somehow in my diet. Um, I will make ginger tea. I have ginger tea in my refrigerator right now. Straight, strong ginger tea that I will use before a meal as a kind of a stimulant for digestion. I'll add it to kombucha tea. I'll add it to some tea for, add some honey and lemon. Um, so things like this are always kind of on my radar. Um, and as Chef Floyd Cordos would say, if you're working with a dry spice, you're always blooming that with some heat and oil. Yes. Spices, you don't eat spices raw. Um, spices need to be what's called bloomed, um, which means you heat them up first. Numerous ways to heat them up, dry roast or roasting with a little fat um, until the flavor, the aroma and the flavor start, the aroma first. The aroma starts coming out, they start darkening in color a little bit. And that's where they start releasing their potential, uh, their medicinal potential, but even their flavor potential. That's when the dish really starts getting deep. Yeah, so that is one thing I learned from Chef Floyd. He is a master of spices. And I'm so happy I've, I learned that because uh, it's a really great tip. And back to simplicity, if you're adding this flavor, if you're adding this intentional um, ingredient with an eye towards health, you're adding it to something very common, very accessible, hopefully in season and affordable broccoli, and you're adding seasoning to it. It is your seasoning. It's, it's personal to your journey, and it makes that broccoli your thing. Mm -hmm. um, Joy, you want to add on this? With an eye towards lunch and uh, the fact that yeah. we're all uh, now too busy for lunch? Well, I think that um, soups are really a good idea for lunch because I feel like that satisfies and it gets nutrition to go in. It's like I heard Dr. Graham just did a carrot ginger soup for the um, for his demo and I think it's really so that's where you can incorporate and you know turmeric also needs to be given with black pepper so that it does assimilate mm -hmm. so it's really interesting that it is it's all this interaction and it's really you know Henry I think we talked about this what makes me feel good and and to know that I think it's very smart that Deneen plans lunch, dinner when lunch is finished because we do need to, and before our blood sugar gets low, we do need to make sure that we know what we're having and for our meals. So I think planning is really important, and I like simple foods at the restaurant. I mean, I eat most of my meals at Candle Cafe. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Joy, I just want to pause there to drive that point home. Um, when you're talking to people about their nutritional choices, immediately after eating and cleaning up, thinking about your next meal is the optimal place to make smart food choices. If you wait till you're out on the street, you're cold, you're wet, you're hungry, you're going to make bad choices and you're not going to have at the access that you planned ahead of time. So when we started talking about breakfast, I think at least half the panel talked about making breakfast choices in the nighttime. Yeah, and, and I was a practicing nutritionist before I got involved in the restaurant business. Um, so it really was like you didn't have any choice. If your blood sugar was low, and I had many patients who would just say, oh my God, I don't have a choice. I went into the cabinet and I needed to grab the candy bar because that was the quickest way that my blood sugar would go up. So yes, planning for lunch would be something, you know, and you, Henry's also has a wonderful kale salad, so for me it would be a soup and salad, it would be possibly a sandwich, it would be an entree. I mean, there's so many delicious things that we make at the restaurant that I don't really have a, um, but if I was going to make it myself, it would be a whole other story. <laughs> yeah, and I think when you... And I love to cook. When you're counseling people about lunch, you're talking about portability. Yeah. Right? And I think another thing that's really important is to think about the vessels that you're going to pour, you're going to carry your food in and investing in a good vessel uh, for your food, for your water, um, is something you're going to fill like you fill yourself every day. Anyone else want to weigh in on lunch? Yeah, I'd like to jump in on this. Um, one of the things that I actually do is on my Google Maps, I um, star or flag specific locations, whether it be a health food store or a restaurant or a cafe or like a, you know, if, if they're really out there, like a, some form of health supportive um, bodega so that whenever I'm in a different part of the city or really anywhere 
I have a resource to be able to go, some place that I know I can I can walk like a few blocks or um, you know some place within close range to be able to access something that I know has uh, you can provide a healthy meal or a healthy snack to me. So I mean I'm sure we're all kind of bouncing around all over the city between jobs and or school or uh, you know going to see friends or whatever. And so that's become a really helpful resource for me to be able to find a place that I, that I can trust. So you have to do a little bit of research, but plug those into your map and, and you can navigate around with a little bit more ease and confidence in uh, making decisions about what you eat. I love that. Um, my entire life is planned uh, based on where the next uh, reliable source of nutrition is going to come, <laughs> as Deneen knows. And I think that's a great, super practical piece you of too. advice. If no one else wants to weigh in on lunch, uh, let's talk about dinner and uh, anything we want to weigh in on dinner. Sure. I mean, I, actually, I would like to, but even just in terms of all meals, I think one of the conversations that I think is worth having is that one should begin to eat with intention. Um, I think that, and this is something that can actually go through all socioeconomic categories and all, all parts of, of, of society, is that, you know, why are you eating and what are you eating for? And a lot of times, I think we as citizens, all of us, myself included at times, we eat without realizing that we're eating, right? So we're eating to fill an emotional void. We're eating because we're nervous. We're eating because we're on the go. And I think the candy bar points a good one. Well, that's the only guy I could grab and my knees were shaking. And, and we don't actually get two seconds to think about kind of eating with intention. And when we're at the school, you know, some of the things we teach our chefs in training is certainly kind of as you're preparing menus and you're preparing meals and you're thinking about what's going on a plate is actually to think about that intention. And we also ask our students to think about kind of the intuitive eater, right? So, so asking individuals and those of you are, who are here uh, in food studies to think about kind of those individuals and those health coaches of like, you know, what are you trying to eat for and what matters and understand what you're doing and then prepare your meal around that and then get to the point of beginning to look at kind of like, well then, I know that I want to uh, lose weight, I know that I need more energy, I know that I have a problem with, with diabetes, I know that I have these things, and I need to then kind of plan for how can I navigate my life around that. So I think if you eat with kind of understanding yourself and understanding kind of your intention of eating, then you can put the right filter in place to understand that, okay, so if I only have $10 in my wallet, um, where can I choose my meal? And it may be that uh, McDonald's is the only option. And, and as a natural foods, you know, <laughs> running a natural foods colony, I just go like, ah, please. Um, but maybe there's parts around the country that that is the only option. And so if you go into McDonald's, well then choose your menu, choose from the menu the best possible way that you can. Because incremental eating can, or, or making incremental choices with what's available is also a form of, I think, healthful eating. And I think everyone that has, has an opportunity then to participate in, and eat well for themselves. Um, I think planning is, is critically important. Uh, I did a six-month program with a functional doctor where I spent a lot of time working on my microbiome and thinking about my gut health and, and understanding what that's emerging technology in terms of technology, right? A former, <laughs> a former tech guy talking about this, but the, it, it's, it's, an, it, it's an emerging kind of, of line of thinking in terms of certainly everything starts in the gut. And as I began to kind of think about what I was ingesting personally, and, and I took out everything from my diet as an experiment. I was a vegetarian who reintroduced some animal protein for six months because I had taken out green, uh, grains, beans, legumes, mm -hmm. sugar, uh, salt, eggs, any dairy. Uh, basically, if you liked anything, it wasn't in my diet. Um, and I was eating just you know tons of fresh seasonal vegetables and small amounts of animal protein in order to get kind of that protein to really understand what was going on with my gut health and well-being and then started to introduce things back as I returned more to a, a traditional plant-based diet. But it was hard, right? And it was hard to run through daily life and, and kind of make choices. And if you weren't being able to food prep, you know, I had to learn how to make solutions as it resulted. So I could get a salad from some place, but then I had to make sure I got everything on the side. And I got a soup or, or it was, breakfast was really hard because I wasn't eating eggs. Um, and when you thought about the other options that were available, well, who doesn't like a croissant, um, but that wasn't viable, 
right? So then you started thinking like, well, then I need to reimagine what's on my plate for breakfast. And all of a sudden, butternut squash became a really yummy b breakfast option. And I found places that could get me butternut squash for breakfast. So I think a, a good lesson in terms of thinking about food is really thinking about why you're eating and what's your intention of food and what you need it for and educate people there and then make those food choices to plan your, your plate accordingly. Yeah, and uh, back to what Dr. Uh, Tresino said in the previous panel, um, the consistent simple theme I know of successful food people is planning. And planning turns into pleasure because you take out the uh, hangry, hungry, uh, only based on what's accessible immediately in front of you and you start to actually plan your pleasure and everyone knows the feeling of a full stomach. Many people that we work with and we deal with in our life today also know 25% of American kids go to bed with food insecurity at some point in their day. Um, Galen, did you want to add to that a little bit? Yeah, so this is actually this is a kind of a fascinating field that I've done some of my own research on is um, in neurogastronomy which is basically where our brain starts to identify um, emotions associated with foods. And that can totally drive behaviors and patterns that we get into, and then all of a sudden we're you know, down the path of becoming diabetic or obese or whatever. So I think it's, it's a worthwhile investment to, um, in time, really. Uh, if you can find a professional, if you have resources to um, work with a professional, that's obviously great too. But when you, you just start to become more aware, just pay attention to what, what emotions are driving your decision to want to eat and then what decisions you're making about which foods you're going to put in your mouth based on that logic. And as you start to pay attention and become more clear on some of that, um, then you can really start to back it out. If you're eating sugary foods or you know, high, like high starchy foods or high carbs or whatever you need, you can start to back that out and kind of invent your own plan. But become attuned to your own resources and decision making. I think one thing to add to that also is don't be too hard on yourself when you like make a mistake and eat too much uh, in the evening or something like that and you know you're ready to go to bed and you're just so full and you know you shouldn't have done that. You know and then you can beat yourself up or just say okay forget it I'll learn from that and go on the next the next thing. And that brings it to another point is that you know, we spend, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about food, but to me it's like this eternal triangle that's going on uh, where there's food and everything that goes around food and making the meal and planning the meal, but then there's also our digestive system. And, you know, you can get the most beautiful organic apple right in season, local, and if your digestive system, you know, is not as weak and not up to it, you're not going to get the maximum out of that. So that's the second piece of that triangle. The third piece of the triangle is how, how we eat. Do we, you know, do, are we in the habit of just eating on the run, eating fast, of even, thing, even simple things like drinking too much while you're eating? That dilutes the digestive juices, and you're weakening your digestive system during that time. So the most beautiful quinoa and kale salad with four or five glasses of water is not the best thing to do. You should be just sipping a little bit. So keeping all this in mind and kind of just understanding that that's, that's what goes into it. Uh, and you begin to, as Galen alluded to, you begin to have a better sense of yourself with food, um, you know, and, and your decisions and what's, what's going to be right for you and what's not going to be right for you. I'd like to admit that I eat on the run too often. <laughs> <laughs> not as mindfully as, as I'd like. I, I love to hear the planning. It's a theme to, in this panel, which I hadn't expected. But I often find myself just short on time, right? So I plan knowing that when I travel, you know, my, it'd be a nightmare of mine to end up only having a McDonald's eat at. So I, ahead of time, I don't want to find a place where there are no good choices and I'm hungry and I'm late and I have to make a poor choice. So I actually find myself, I only trust a couple national brands of quick service food places. It's it's generally chipotle, and I'll get a, a bowl with fajita vegetables and guacamole and lettuce and beans. Or, in the last couple of years, Panera has sort of turned a corner and got rid of artificial ingredients. And they have like a Greek salad, black bean combination that 
I find I've learned to trust and it makes me feel good. So it's totally the most boring thing in the world to eat the same meals when I travel a lot, but it prevents me from getting in a position where I'd be looking at that menu at McDonald's and, and, and filled with the self-loathing that I, I don't want to be that easy on myself. Right? And when it comes to convenience when I'm not traveling, you know, and I, I of course, have to, I have to plug the, the salad greens for business, right? I think salads, we talked about bases for breakfast. Salads, of course, are terrific bases for, for anything we put on top of. I tend to make batches, right? So I'll make batches of roasted vegetables, and if I've got time, I'll just, you know, I've got a little Japanese container that things go in for, for my lunch, and you can shove cut up pickles and roasted vegetables on, on spinach or spring mix, and it's a delightful, fast, easy lunch that didn't require a lot of time. Yeah, and for breakfast, greens are great to blend in yeah. the juices. Um, and I would also add, um, you can tell my tribe sitting right over here, my wife, Deneen, also loves to uh, wrap things in greens. So mm -hmm. if you have a more substantial green, like a chard, it does really well as a wrap to fill and carry, so you don't always have to use bread to wrap everything. Yeah. Joy, I want to hear from you about that. What do you want to hear? I think it's, it's so <laughs> it's fascinating. It's about just taking care of yourself. I'm just getting that no matter what it is, whether it's putting in those stackable containers, and it's about really taking care of what your body needs and listening to your body, like, and, and really knowing how to fuel it and feed it. I think it's amazing, and, and it takes time, but it's really a fun time if you make it about you. Like, who takes care of you? Which you get to take care of yourself in that way. I think it's, it's so amazing. I just, I don't know, I just was thinking about how important it is and how we really, we think of food as sort of a byproduct instead of it is the foundation for our nourishment. And it is, you know, Bart would say it's harder to change people's eating habits Harder to change people's eating habits than their the religion or their politics, and we know about those two other things. Um, so it's it's and it's also so we need to change it together. I guess is what I was thinking. Thinking that to make it fun and to not have the reputation of of being drudgery, like drudgery doesn't work. And really, it gets exciting to think about how to prepare for yourself. But also, we're so not used to it. And I think that's also something really important. And I think we see it in kids, and we need kids to start to take that responsibility. And our bodies tell us what we need. Like, I'll go, oh, my God, I feel it. I need those greens. Like, I need to cook greens tonight. I need to cook them with garlic. And I need, it's something that my body's craving. And my cravings, I used to read a menu from the back to the front. I used to read dessert first because I wasn't balanced. But when I started eating nutrient-dense foods and I started nourishing myself, then it changed, and then you could really hear them. The, the signs and the signals will tell you, even Ayurvedic principles will tell you what you need in order to feel taken care of and nourished. And that nourishment really does, that's what health is all about. Yeah, and also I think uh, it's important to point out to people who are in transition in their food habits that your taste, your sense of taste yeah. changes rather dramatically, particularly as you remove salt saturated fats, sugars, Definitely. you start to taste things again in a much uh, more refined way. And uh, you, uh, it's a, a win. Um, I wouldn't eat any other way. I mean, even if I had the, somebody said you could eat anything, I love the way I eat because I love the way it makes me feel. It's like I heard somebody speak on a panel. They said they love the way they felt the next morning. I love, I love that food. You know, we talk a lot about this, that food does influence our mood. It influences everything, our body functions, everything. You know, like you said, Richard, that's the basis. Yeah. I'm, so thinking of the students, I'm thinking of our students in our school. It's really kind of interesting. You know, they're surrounded by food. They're taking cooking classes all day. You know, one class could be just on grains. So, so you know, at the end of the class, they're having a tasting of 10 different kind of grains. It's not the most balanced meal, but that's the class. But... Many of them, many, 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 I notice, bring, bring a lunch. They, they have something, a little container. They bring their lunch. We give them a time. This is lunch, lunch, break. And they go into the lounge or they sit in the classroom. They break out their lunch. Um, they, they, use the kitchen, they actually use the kitchens and heat it up. So obviously they're thinking about it. They're thinking about it. They're thinking about what am I going to have that today? 
you know, for lunch. I don't know what's going on in dinner, but for lunch, they certainly have put some thought into it, and they make sure that they're, they're eating some good food. I look, I see a lot of good food there. And they go into the second class and have beans all the afternoon. <laughs> 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 but, you know, they're, they're putting their thought into it. Yeah, I'll actually <laughs> piggyback on that because one of the most, one of the, among the whole program, but one of the more interesting things that we did at the Natural Gourmet Institute was to deconstruct traditional baking recipes in a five-step process where we went from like baking chocolate chip cookies to making them purely vegan. So we learned about kind of substitutes through that process and that was really fascinating. So part of the message there is to experiment. Mm -hmm. Experiment with different ingredients, you know, hone in on what your taste buds tell you, how your body reacts to that and use it as a, a learning process to, to really become more in tune to your body. And not to be intimidated. I think we get intimidated like people go, oh my God, how do you cook tofu? Right. And I, I was teaching at um, Food and Finance High School and I had a gentleman in the audience, I was doing a tofu dish and he was like, I'm gonna take that home. My mom is uh, in a wheelchair and I could cook that for her. But he got excited about it because we got excited about it and he, but it's like not to be intimidated by it. And what you said before is like you could make a mistake in a recipe. I'll never yeah. forget my first recipe. What I made, I the mixed. best. The best recipes are based on mistakes. <laughs> yeah. And That's I right. think it's it's really uh, the um, that food preparation and planning piece starts to build not only physical health but also build psychological mm -hmm. health and gives you the confidence to experiment and fail and be okay with that and come back and do it again. Um, we're wrapping up shortly. I just want to quickly go and hear from everyone on uh, one or two uh, beverage pointers, because beverage is the piece that's left out of food very consistently and is very, very important. Anyone want to start? I'll, I'll start on that one. Uh, I'm also of the belief, and it's a popular one these days, to try not to get too many calories out of your beverage. So definitely, you know, sodas and added sugars, no, no. I mean... It's even surprising how a glass of orange, much, how much sugar is in a glass of orange juice. It just builds up calories. It's not that I don't have it, but I just I keep an eye on that. I do like teas. I like teas a lot. Um, you know, herbal teas, green teas, and I like to make my own. You know, like a spice tea, like like uh, fennel with mint tea with a little bit of lemon and honey. It's very delicious. It's a nice digestive. Um, you can substitute things. You can do cumin one day, and you can instead of mint tea, you can go green tea, jasmine green. I love jasmine green. So I do like uh, juices. I like I'm not juices, teas, teas like that. And um, and I'm a kombucha lover. Um, I make my own kombucha. I have been doing that for numerous years now, and I just I love my own kombucha. <laughs> uh, and I and I'll add things to it. I'll add a little bit of. Um, you know, I'll add a little bit of cranberry juice, but it's a little bit. I'll add a little bit of ginger juice to it. Um, I have a glass every single morning. Anyone else? I'll uh, I'll go. I, I'm a, I'm a believer in uh, no during the day. I never want to get calories from beverages. Like I just I just, you know I drink coffee, sometimes tea, but otherwise it's it's always water. And I don't understand most of the beverage industry. I don't think it does any good in the world. <laughs> and I'm, I'm particularly against bottled water in places like New York City. You know, I, this is from Ontario, California. I actually grew up near there. <laughs> it's not a place, I saw you brought your water bottle. It's not a place with a lot of, with a lot of water, by the way. Um, <laughs> you know, and when I go to Guatemala, I'm happy to drink the bottled water. It makes it for my health, but I, I, I don't think it's got a place in, uh, you know, my company's catering contracts always make it clear, no soda, no bottled water. Uh, and when I do get calories from beverages, you know, it's, it's having wine or a cocktail, and I sort of treat it as, as my dessert. You know, I try to avoid desserts because I realize it's an indulgence to have a couple glasses of wine on a Thursday night, and, you know, I treat it as an indulgence on Thursday morning. <laughs> uh, Joy, do you want to have a last word on this? Oh, Henry, you know I like the last word. Um, <laughs> You know, beverages, I love beverages. We have three restaurants with three eco bars. They all have a social mission to them. So one of the, uh, one of Candle 79 sold an acai beverage. And it was an acai sort of tasted like vodka. And they planted 7,900 trees in India. So I love the fact that we have a beverage program that actually is a give back. So everything, 
you know, I love that, and I love our cocktail program, and I love, you know, we make vodka out of quinoa. We don't make it, but somebody makes it for us, and we have a small batch gin maker who uses organic <laughs> cardamom and everything, and it's just beautiful to watch and see. And for me, like, in terms of beverages, one thing we talk a lot about the microbiome is, like, sauerkraut juice. It's really big. We went to the show. Sauerkraut juice, kimchi juice. People are doing shots, but we have like a, a flight of shots at the restaurant, health shots, which was like um, heartbeat. It has beet juice in it with ginger juice and then ginger shots. And um, I love chia frescas. I happen to love beverages. As you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> we, we could go on all day, but that's all the time we have. Thank you, panel, very much. And thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.